All right. Well, continuing in our parables series, last week we took a break to uh, look at a Thanksgiving message about giving thanks and everything. So I'm back to the parables. And as we get ready to dive into this one, I just wanted you to think about what are those words that you want to hear from Jesus, right? What are those things that you want to hear when you meet him face to face, whenever it's all said and done, what is that, that phrase that you're wanting to hear? I would say if we did a poll and we kind of asked most Christians, there would probably be one that's pretty high on the list, that's pretty popular, and it goes like this, well done, good and faithful servant. Right? Isn't that what we want to hear yes. at the end? We want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Who would not want to hear, well done? Right? When you're doing something and, and, and whoever's in charge comes along, uh, whether it's, it's your wife because you're doing a honeydew list, or if it's your father because you're doing some things that he wanted done, or if it's at work. I mean, how many of you guys want to hear things like, well, that could be better. You know what I mean? I, I really wish that you would do that this way or... Really? You're done? Like, I mean, that doesn't look done to me. We don't want to hear things like that. We want to hear, well done, right? When I get done with the job, I want to hear, man, that was good. Like, All right, thank you. What's next? Let's, let's move on. Uh, because to be well done means to be rightly performed. That means that it's done proper, okay? Now, there's a time where we use this term well done where it's not right, okay? A well done steak is not done properly, Katie. <laughs> It's not done right, okay? A well-done steak is ruined. You took a great piece of meat and you might as well throw it in the trash. It's wasted. It's ruined, okay? So we're not talking about steaks. We're talking about our life. For our lives, we want to hear well done. It means you did it right. It means you lived the proper way. I mean, isn't that what we really, really want in life? And so today we're going to look at the parable of the talents and I want, to, want you to consider one thing as we go through this. Uh, I, I kind of started out by, by saying, what do you want to hear at the end, right? Because that's really how we view this parable a lot of times. But, but, but what if you don't have to wait until the end of your life to hear these words from Jesus? What if you don't have to wait until the end of life to hear these words? Matthew 25, verse 14 it starts out like this, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Okay, so this man represents the Lord, okay? He gives to his three servants different amounts of talents. Now, if you're wondering what a talent is, it's a, it's a measurement, right? It's a weight of, at this time, would have been gold or silver, so a different amount of weight. Um, so for gold at this time, it would have been about 200 pounds, okay? So imagine, I mean, even the, the guy who just got one, I mean, how many of you guys would take 200 pounds of gold? Sign me up. Right? I'll take that. I mean, I'll take one pound of gold. I'd be perfectly happy, but it's not really that important. I just wanted some of you are going to be wondering what is a talent, and you're not going to hear anything else. So that's what it is. It's not that important uh, what he's giving here, but the thing is he's giving a certain amount, an amount that matches to each person's ability. So he's giving them something that they can do something with. They are able. They have the ability to do something with it, one gets five, one gets two, one gets one. Verse 16, then he who received the five talents went and traded with them, and he made another five. And likewise, he who received two gained two more. But he who had one went and dug in the ground, and he hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled the accounts with them. So each of these servants takes their talents, they receive what the Lord gives them, and the one with five, I mean, you think about it, he's, he's obviously a sharp guy, he's like, I've got five, what am I going to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do something with it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest it, I'm going to trade, I'm going to do some deals, and he doubles what he has. I mean, amazing, now he's got ten, this is great. The one with two, 
uh, he gets to work also, and he does the same thing. He, I, don't, he, I don't think that he did the same thing the guy with five did, but he did the same thing as in he went and got to work with it. What can I do with this, this stuff that the Lord gave me? How can I use it for benefit, for gain? And he doubled his as well, and then the one dug the hole in the backyard and buried it. Now, if this was the end of the story, it'd be like, wow, man, they, were, they did a great job. They were all successful. Nobody lost anything. Uh, everybody did well. But, but the Lord returns to hold them accountable. Now, you think about that. He gives them the gifts. He gives them these things to do something with. And now he's going to come back to see what they did. Verse 20. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents, and look, I've gained five more besides them. And the Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler of many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I mean, five to ten. Right? Well done. This is, this is a great time to hear, well done. You've done proper. And what did you do proper? You took that that the Lord gave you and you did something with it that pleases the Lord. Well done. Verse 22, he who had two came to the Lord and he said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I gained two more besides them. And the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant, for you have been faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Again, two to four, this is great. These guys are doing well, and they hear well done. They hear properly done. You've done it right. You did something with what you were given, and it pleases the Lord. But then verse 24, he who had one came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. <coughs> reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed, and I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But the Lord answered him and said, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and I gather where I have not scattered, scattered seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So he took the talent with him and he gave it to the one who had ten. For it is for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And he cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at this and I think one-to-one, -one, he didn't lose anything, right? I mean, the master's still getting back what he gave. I mean, he's not getting less, and he says, you wicked and lazy servant. Why is he wicked? Why is he lazy? It seems like he was actually a little bit considerate, right? Like, I don't want to lose it. Like, whatever I do. How many of you guys have done that? I don't want to lose this. I'm going to hide it. And then you don't know where you put it. Right? I mean, thankfully, this guy remembered where he buried it, okay? Because it says the Lord came back after a long time, a long journey. But the problem was is that he did nothing with what he was given. He wasted an opportunity that the Lord had for him. And I think it sounds a little harsh. He kept it safe. But do you know that that's not what the Lord wants for you, is for you to just... Keep it safe. That's what we want. I want to just play it safe. I don't want to do anything that could put me out of my comfort zone or, or anything like that. But the Lord doesn't want us to play it safe. He wants us to be obedient. And he wants us to be faithful to him and to what he's given us. And so if you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, I think this goes beyond just the final day when we go to heaven when we see Jesus and we hear those words, I think it goes beyond that because if you were paying attention, he told both of the first two. You've been faithful with a few things. Now, I will make you ruler over many things. Right? This is right in the midst of the work. 
There's work to continue to be done. There's, there's more for them to do. And, and, and when we look at the scriptures, we even see Jesus hears some words similar to this. Remember when he was baptized, right? He was baptized and the Father spoke down from heaven. He said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I am well pleased with somebody, then it was a job well done. Right? So the father speaks and says, I'm pleased with my son. This is him. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, directly following an act of obedience. Right? Jesus got baptized not because he was a sinner and he had given his life to Christ. Right? He is Christ. You guys know that, right? Okay, so Jesus does this out of an act of obedience. He does this as an example to the others because we know that baptism does not save. Right? You guys understand that baptism does not equal salvation. Jesus didn't need saving. He's the only one who never needed saving. And not only did he not need saving, he really didn't need to get baptized. But he did it out of obedience. And now he saves us. Now we get baptized out of obedience. And if that's something you haven't done yet and you're interested in doing that, listen, this is the importance of baptism. Baptism is an outward declaration of an inward transformation. So it's Christ has done something in my life. I receive him as Lord, and I want to tell everybody. I want to show everybody. It's symbolic. It represents him being buried and raised to life. You going under the water, coming out of the water. It's an amazing, amazing thing, and I think it is one of those steps of obedience that we should do. Okay? But it doesn't save you. Okay, I'm just, I'm just trying to make that point here as, as we go through here. But back to this parable, every time we're obedient to the Lord, I believe we can hear, well done. I believe every time we're obedient to the Lord, we can hear, well done. Now, some of you guys think I'm nuts. You're like, there is no way that the clouds are going to part and God's going to speak down from heaven, well done, every time. Some of you, if you were obedient, he probably would. Okay, some of you don't ever listen. All right? Only two people thought that was funny. The rest of you guys were like, is he talking about me? But, but when we talk about the Lord speaking to us, you know, the, the Lord speaking to us isn't always an audible voice from heaven. As a matter of fact, for most of us, it's usually not an audible voice from heaven. Our God is a God of encouragement. And I'm going to tell you that's one of the roles that the Holy Spirit plays in our lives. John 14, verse 16 to 17, Jesus said, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. This word helper, if you read different translations, it's going to say different things here. Some will say counselor, uh, some will say advocate, but this is one of these words that if you study it in its original Greek, it means a lot of different things and it includes Comforter, it includes counselor, it includes encourager, an intercessor, an advocate. Because what we've got to know is that he's the one that's not only with you, but he's for you. Right? The Holy Spirit builds you up, encourages you, defends you. And so what's the point of this parable? What's the main point of this parable? Because, again, we can use it as to, at the end of your life, you want to hear well done, and we do. You can also use it to show how we're supposed to be responsible financially, good stewards. And that's how we usually hear this, uh, this scripture shared the most. Um, and those are both good. They're both applicable here. But, but I don't think those are the primary purpose. The primary purpose here, each man was given talents that he was supposed to do something with. There's supposed to be some action. It's not about how much... They got. It's about the fact that they got something they were supposed to do something with. For some of you, you might be thinking, well, I don't know if you noticed, but God hasn't given me a whole lot to work with. Okay? I mean, I beg to differ. I think that God's given you a lot more to work with than what you're willing to admit. I think that even sometimes when we think like that, it's our way of letting ourselves off the hook. Right? Well, I don't really have that much to offer. I mean, what am I going to possibly do to serve God, to serve the Lord, to do things for Him. 
Do you know that every living person, every living purpose has been given something from God? Given some kind of gift, some, time, some kind of talents, something they're supposed to be doing something with. I'm going to tell you how I know that this is absolutely true. If you go to Romans chapter 12, we see this verse here in chapter 12, verse 6. It says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. And Paul goes on to list these gifts. He says, there's prophecy, there's ministry or service, there's teaching, there's exhortation, there's giving, there's leading, there's showing mercy. And these are what we often refer to as the gifts of the Father. Okay, they're different from the gifts of the Spirit. They're all spiritual gifts. But these are the gifts of the Father. These are given from the womb, right? From the minute that someone is created, these, some of these gifts are kind of infused, injected into them, into their personality. How many of you guys see little kids, maybe even babies, that you're like, this kid's going to be a leader, right? They have the gift of leading. I mean, how many of you see little kids? I saw... I shouldn't even share this. It's, probably, it's a little bit embarrassing that I watched this. But I saw this video I was kind of fascinated by it this morning, actually. I, I was getting ready to come to the church. I had these four little kids, little toddlers. They couldn't be more than like, I don't know, maybe just barely walking. And they were all just taking turns giving each other hugs. And giving, and it's like, you see like, there's this one kid, the one wanted to hug everybody every time. It's like, he'd hug somebody and two people, the other two would be hugging, he'd go over and he'd kind of be like, Kind of get in there and, and hug the other one. And it's like, man, I look at those kids and I'm like, that kid's got the gift of mercy. Like he just, he wants to love on and comfort and, and strengthen. And like the kid's like 18 months old or something. But you can see these things in people even from the time that they're babies or small children because they're things that the Lord has put in them. These are gifts from the Lord. We have differing gifts according to the grace that is given to us. Let us use them, Paul says. It's obedience. Have you ever seen an unbeliever who is absolutely killing it at life? Everything is going right for them. They've got everything. They're so good at what they do. And you wonder why. You wonder how. I'd like to suggest to you this morning that maybe they're using their God-given gifts that he put in them. Maybe that's why they're so successful. It's not necessarily a favor of the Lord. It's not necessarily the Lord is like, this person doesn't know me and is running from me, but I want to bless them. It's that they're using the gifts that he had already given. Well, there's a lot of Christians who are burying them in the backyard. I believe it's true. I believe it's true. Maybe you think that's crazy. But I don't know if you remember, there's this time where Jesus is dividing people. And this guy says, Lord, I've healed the sick in your name. I've, I've visited people in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I did all these things in your name. Right? All of these things I did in your name. And Jesus says what to him? Depart from me. I never knew you. You remember that? How were those people able to heal? In his name. How are they able to cast out demons in his name? How are they able to do all these things? Maybe part of it is that they were using some of their God given gifts that he infused into their character and their personality. But he says, I never knew you. In this parable, we see the one that got two doubled what they were given. And, and what I see here is. The one that got two didn't start with the same as the one that got five. Right? The one that got two didn't get the same as the one that got five. They didn't end up with the same amount. They were, ended up with different amounts, ten against four. There's still some difference here. But they both were told, well done. They both were told, you'll be blessed because of what you've done. You'll be given more. It's not so much about productivity and results as it is doing something. Just trying to do something. Jesus gave them something. They did something with it. <clears throat> he didn't discipline the second guy for not doing as much as the first. 
This is the other thing that Christians have such a hard time with. We're always trying to compare ourselves and do what the other person did. The guy that got five, he doubled his to ten. The guy that had two didn't say, I got a, what, what's, top, what's five? It's not quadruple, that's four. I got to get five times as much, right? I got to get to ten because he got to ten. Or I got to get to eleven because he got to ten. It's not about that. He's like, God gave me two. I'm going to do something with that too. And look, praise the Lord, I got four. We're not in competition with one another, church. That, should, that deserves a couple of amens. We're not in competition with one another. And some of you need to hear that this morning. The goal is not that we're to outproduce one another. The goal is that we're to take what God has given us. And we're to be obedient and do something with it. So you think about what has God given you this morning? You don't look at Bud and like, well, man... God's given Bud that, and I kind of like that, and I kind of like what he gets as a result, so I'm going to try to do that. Listen, that's, that's not going to get you anywhere. You're going to end up losing it. What has God given you, and how can you use that to further the kingdom? How can you use that to please him? What are you supposed to be doing with what God gave you? It's about doing, taking a chance, taking a risk. Too much of the church is afraid to move. Too much, I mean... Listen, I've been there. I've, I've sat on my hands, and I still do this from time to time, where I'm like, well, I'll do that when this, right? And I got these terms, right? If, if, if God does this, or, or if this person says that to me, then I'll do it. No, do. Just do it. Take a chance, take a risk. What's the worst that could happen if you put yourself out there to use what God has given you, and you're wrong? What's the worst that could happen? You look like a fool, right? Is that really all that bad? I look foolish on a regular basis. Okay? It's okay. It's okay. It's a little bit of a, a hurt to your, your pride. Sometimes we need that. I think there's some of us that we need that pretty bad. Pretty desperately. We need some humility. But did you catch the rebuke of the third guy? Again, it was because he did nothing. I really believe if he would have said, Master, uh, you know, I tried this and I tried that and, and I, I broke even. Here's your one back. I really believe if you would have done that, it would have been well done, good and faithful servant. Like you did something. So what if it didn't work out? You were obedient. And, and I tell people all the time, like, there's nothing I'm more afraid of than not being obedient to what I know God tells me to do. Nothing. I want to be obedient. And if he would have said that, if he would have been obedient, I really believe even if he would have lost it and said, Master, I tried this and I lost it all and I have nothing, but, but I, I did, right? I took some action. I, I, I had some faith. I was believing for this and it just didn't work out. I don't believe he would have been called a wicked and lazy servant. I believe he would have heard, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not about the return. It's about the faithful obedience. It's about the action. I don't know about you, but 10 times out of 10, I will take someone who is teachable and that works hard over someone that has talent and knows everything. Every time I'll take somebody that's teachable and will work hard. You can show them what you want done, they'll do it right and they'll get it done. The people with talent, they have so much talent, they do things on their time, they already know everything. You can't possibly tell them a better way to do something, right? They're terrible to be around. This man was will, unwilling to take the risk with what he had been given. And I'm going to tell you that displeases the Lord when we're unwilling to take those risks. But because I'll tell you that the Lord was a risk taker. You guys know that? You guys think like, well, Jesus was God. He had everything all figured out. He was a risk taker. I'm going to tell you that he took some pretty big risks in associating with sinners and tax collectors. And what did it get him? Right? All the religious leaders hated him. They all hated him. They questioned what he was doing. It was a risk because they were after him. Because of that. I'm going to tell you that if he would have went to them and been buddy-buddy with them, it would have been a different story. He's a risk taker because he healed on the Sabbath. Right? That was a big risk. But he's like, this man needs something that's so much greater. He was a risk taker whenever he 
not only healed a man, but then he forgave him of his sins. Again, he does all these things in front of the religious leaders. He's taking risks. They could kill him for these things. They tried and tried and tried. He risked his life. And for us to look at him, or look like him, we've got to do something too. We can't just sit around and do nothing. I love the book of James. I probably refer to it almost every week because it's my favorite, but James tells us we've got to be doers of the word not hearers only, right? You can't just hear it. It's got to motivate you to actually take action and do something. This third man wasn't willing to do anything. Why? He said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Right? I knew you to be a hard man that reaped where you hadn't sown and gathered where you hadn't scattered seed. And I was afraid... And I went and hid your talent in the ground. He was afraid. You guys see that? That's why he didn't do anything because of fear. There's a song on the radio. I think we've sang it here before. I love it. It's called Fear is a Liar. Right? One of the things it says is that he will stop you in your tracks. Right? Stop you in your steps. Fear is a liar. And you know we know that perfect love casts out fear. Fear. This man was afraid of the Lord because he believed the lies. He believed that the Lord was a harsh man. He believed that he was rough, that he was violent. He thought the Lord was this ruthless and cruel leader that uh, took what he, what he wanted, that wasn't his, and did whatever he wanted. It's clear just by what he said that this man didn't have a true knowledge of who the Lord was. He didn't really know the Master. He didn't know the truth. He believed the lion was driven by fear. He didn't know Jesus. And you say, how could that be? How could that be? Jesus gave him the talent. <coughs> Jesus gave him the talent to do something with. I would say to you that these first two men knew Jesus. Right? Everybody is born with some kind of talents. Everybody is born with some kind of gifting. We've all been given something to do something with. These first two men knew Jesus. They knew, this is why they could take the risk, they knew he was a God of mercy and grace. They knew that he was a God of both love and justice. And they knew that if they were obedient, that everything would be okay. See, it's a lot easier to take a risk for Jesus whenever you understand that he shows mercy and grace. It's a lot easier to take a risk for Jesus when you understand that, yes, he is a just God and he does discipline, but he does it all in love. It's a lot easier to take the risk and to be obedient. They just knew if they were just obedient that he would be pleased because it's not about the results as much as it is about the faithfulness and the trust that drives them to action. See, in God's kingdom, faithfully risking everything that you've got for his glory, for his purpose, I'm going to tell you, no matter what the results are, it pleases the Lord, and it results in well done, good and faithful servant. I believe that. I believe the Spirit can speak that to your heart. I believe that he can speak that to your heart in everything that you do. I would say you can test the Lord in that. Not I'm going to do this to see if you do this, but when I am faithful, I want you to listen. I want you to say, what was the Lord speaking? Is he showing me? If you guys would stand to your feet this morning. And as we, uh, as we get ready to open the altars, I just want you to think about a couple of things. You would close your eyes and bow your heads this morning. There's a few things we see in this story. We, see, we can pick up a lot of things from these men. And the first one is that we've got to know the Lord. I mean, if you don't know Jesus, if there's a question in your heart, if you're not sure, would you take the risk today of stepping forward and saying, I want to know him. I want to know him more. I want to be sure that I know him. Would you take that risk this morning? 
You're not promised another day. You're not promised another opportunity. Today might be the day that you need to get that locked in that you'll hear that well done, good and faithful servant. For some of you, maybe you know the Lord, but you're still struck with fear. You're still afraid to move because you're worried. You're worried about what could happen. You're worried about what might happen. You're worried about what if I get this response? What if I sound stupid? What if I don't remember the right words or, or, or I mess something up and I even tell somebody something that's wrong? Can I tell you today that Jesus is a God of grace and mercy. And if you step out in <coughs> obedience in faithfulness to serve him to do something. And I've got to, got to, got to believe that he'll reward that. He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. There may be a little bit of, hey, next time let's try this. Let's do it this way. Let's, let's add in this. But I'm going to tell you there's not going to be discipline. You're not going to get called wicked and lazy for doing something for the Lord. And then we've got the ones, some of you are like the five and the two. That you've got something and you do it, you use it, you do things with it, but maybe you're kind of, you're running out of ideas. You're kind of thinking, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting dry. I'm getting kind of stale in what I'm doing. And, and it seems like the Lord's given me more opportunity and I don't even know how to step into it. you come forward and let us pray and believe in faith that God's going to do something amazing in your life that he'll blow open the doors. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the parables. We thank you for uh, the way that you speak in these things that are kind of almost a, a story that has mysteries within it. And Lord, as, as, as we read it and we hear it and we Internalize it, Lord. We just we declare that none of that does any good if we don't have your spirit. Lord, would you speak to our hearts right now and show each and every one of us what it is that we need to receive today? Let us not walk out of this place without receiving what you have for us. Regardless of our reason for coming in, Lord, we don't want to leave the same. We want to leave changed and transformed and renewed and encouraged and built up and on fire with a passion for your name. Lord, let that happen in this place today as we worship you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.